Shall we pray? Father, how thankful we are today for the privilege and the opportunity of knowing you, serving you, and living in that secret place of the Most High. Living in fellowship with you as you dwell in us and as we dwell in you. Lord, may the Holy Spirit open our hearts now that we might have understanding of your love and of your truth and of your grace towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There are some passages of Scripture that are so rich that a person hesitates expounding them because you know that there is no way that you can plumb the depths. And there is always that sense when you have completed your exposition that you failed to say what should be said. John 3.16 is one of those passages of Scripture that I hesitate to try to expound. Psalm 91 is another passage of Scripture that I hesitate to expound. But because that is where we are, that is our reading. We want to talk to you for a little bit this morning about where you live, where you should be living. As the psalmist declares, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Just where is that secret place of the Most High? In the previous psalm, Psalm 90, the psalm of Moses, a man of God, he begins that psalm by declaring, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. That secret place of the Most High is dwelling in that conscious fellowship and relationship with God. Now, in a technical sense, we all of us are living in God. You can't escape his presence. As David said, where, there, where can I flee from your presence, O Lord? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I descend into hell, you're there. And the presence of God is inescapable in the universe. God fills the universe and beyond the universe. The heavens of heavens cannot contain him. But tragically, many people are not aware of the presence of God. They are not conscious of God. And thus, they are living a life that is almost oblivious to the existence of God. God is not a part of their life. It is not a part of their process of thinking or of rationalizing or of determining their uh, future, their decisions. God has no place in their life. They're dwelling outside of that place. the secret place of the Most High. In verse 9 of the text, the psalmist declared, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. So he is talking about making God your dwelling place, or living in him, dwelling in him. The secret place of the Most High is that place of dwelling in 
him in Christ. In Ephesians, Paul said that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. The Greek word that he uses translated to dwell is literally to settle down and make himself at home. Now, there are places where you feel very comfortable. You can settle down and feel at home. And there are other places where you might be, where you might be living, which are a strain. You never feel comfortable there. I had a very wealthy uncle who lived in Santa Barbara, my father's brother. We would go up to visit him two or three times a year, but I never felt at home. Before we would get there, I would get the lecture. Sit in the chair, don't touch anything. <laughs> don't ask for candy, you know, and, and just sit there and behave yourself. Uh, he had all these expensive trinkets and all around the house, and my parents were worried sick that, you know, playing with one of these things or touching one of these things, I might knock it over and break it, and they couldn't afford to replace it. And, and thus, it was always a strain at my uncle's house. My grandmother on my mother's side also lived in Santa Barbara, but lived in a very humble little house. Um, she always knew when we were coming up, and she would always bake these special cookies. And, uh, man, I was at home in my grandma's house. <laughs> I could run out into the kitchen any time and get a cookie. I could get into the refrigerator. I was just at home in her house. And I felt at home in her. It was just, you know, that's the kind of place as a boy I like to be at grandma's house with all these exotic cookies that she would bake for us. My uncle's house, no, that was a strain. Never did once feel at home there. It's interesting how some people seem to have sort of a strained relationship with God. You know, whenever they sense the presence of God, it's, you know, just sort of, don't touch anything, don't look, you know, crossways or anything, just, you know, and, and, and they have sort of a strain. It's not that comfortable, relax, settle down, make yourself at home kind of a thing. And yet that's just the kind of a relationship God wants with you. He wants you to feel at home with him. He wants to feel at home with you. That's the secret place of the Most High. He that dwelleth, that is, has settled down and made himself at home in the secret place of the Most High. Jesus speaks of our dwelling in him and of his dwelling in us. Jesus said, in that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This neat kind of a fellowship and relationship as he lives in me and I live in him. And we all live in the Father. As John is writing his first epistle, four different times he speaks about abiding in him and he in us. And he relates this abiding in him and he abiding in us to the keeping of his commandments in chapter 3, verse 24. For whoso keepeth his commandments abideth in him, and he also abides in him. He relates it to our loving one another, which, of course, is his commandment. Jesus said, this is commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. And he said, he that loveth another abides in him, and he abides in him. In chapter 4, verse 15, he relates it to confessing that Jesus is the Son of God. Whoso confesseth that Jesus is the Son of God abides in him, and he also in him. And then in 4.16, he relates it to dwelling in love. For whoso dwells in love abides in him. So that 
abiding relationship, that secret place of the Most High, comes by confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, keeping His commandments to love one another, and thereby living in love, dwelling in this place of love. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, in that conscious presence of God, confessing Jesus to be the Son of God, dwelling in that love, loving one another. Oh, what benefits come to the person who is living there. And in the psalm, he begins to declare the various benefits. He said, he shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It is, it is like God is just overshadowing my life with his love. Wherever I go, I'm surrounded by him. He is watching over me, hovering over me, so to speak. Just And I live right there in the shadow of his presence and of his love. Thus God becomes my refuge and my fortress. So, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, the place of safety, the place of comfort, the place of rest, my refuge. But He's also my fortress, which is the place of defense and strength. In the book of Proverbs, it speaks about four things that are upon the earth that are little, but they are exceedingly wise. It talks about the ant. It says that he lays up his food in the summer. Now, I don't know how big an ant's brain is, but it can't be very big because an ant's not that big. I mean, you talk about miniaturization, you must have it with an ant brain. And yet the ants have brains, pretty good brains. The ant realizes that winter is coming. Somehow in that little brain, as it computes, it knows that it can't go out and gather food in the winter time. An ant can't swim. And that way you can have an interesting ant farm right in your house and all you have to do is put it on an island in a bowl surrounded by water. They'll never leave. They can't, they can't swim. And so uh, it, it's fascinating to have your own little ant farm under control in the house, just surrounded with water. <laughs> and of course the little ants right now, somehow their, their brain computes and tells them, hey, it's not long till winter. I don't know if they are measuring the days, how long they are, realize they're getting shorter, winter's coming, but man, they're working overtime right now. And uh, they'll probably be around to visit you to see if you left anything for them for the winter time. But they, they lay up store during the summer because they know that the inevitable is coming when they won't be able to get out and to gather their food. And thus they manifest a great deal of wisdom and Many times, greater wisdom than man. With our expanded brains and so forth, there are a lot of people, we know that ultimately death is coming, even as the ant knows that winter is coming. And though we know that death is coming, we don't make any preparation for it. The ant has enough wisdom to make preparation. The Bible says, work for the night is coming when no man can work. You know, what you are, are going to do for God, we must do now. And the ant has enough wisdom to take advantage of the opportunities now, knowing that those opportunities won't always be there. He prepares for the future, and yet there are people who are living their life with no thought of the future or preparation for the future at all. But the second, and I didn't mean to talk about that, but the second thing, that he made mention of was the coney, he said, is a feeble folk, 
but he makes his home in the rock. Now, a coney is a hydrax, and um, I don't know if it's related more to a guinea pig or to a rat. It looks like an overgrown guinea pig, but it sort of, uh, well, it sort of hops like a rabbit, so it might be related to the rabbit family. I don't know which family it really belongs to, but it's, it's an interesting animal. There are a lot of them over there uh, around, um, oh, the Dead Sea area down in the area of En Gedi, and, and uh, the hydrax is a very feeble animal. It doesn't really have any self-defense mechanisms. And so it makes its home in the rock. It shows its wisdom that I know that I can't defend myself. I know that I'm just a puny little hydrax and there's, I have no defense uh, weapons. And so he, he makes his home in the rock. And there in the rock, the, the, the fox can dig at it, it can bark at it, it can, uh, but it can't touch it. The only way the fox could get to it would be to tear the rock apart. And, and so it's pretty wise. If the Lord is my fortress, the enemy cannot really get to me except he first of all destroy the fortress in which I have found refuge. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. How great it is to have the strength of God defending me. To know that dwelling here in the secret place of the Most High, I am safe from the predators that would like to destroy me because they can't get to me except they first destroy the fortress in which I have found refuge. Surely, he said, he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. What is meant by snare of the fowler? In the days before they had guns, they trapped birds. And there were many different bird traps. And the only way you could eat, you know, birds was to trap them. And uh, so the snare of the fowler was the trap that the fowler the man who trapped birds, would set for the birds. Uh, when I was a little kid, we used to make bird traps. Take an orange crate and put a stick under one end and tie a string to the stick and run the, strick, uh, the string over under the bushes, and then you'd take bird feed and put it out there and lead a little trail right under the box. And hopefully the birds would come, get busy eating the food, come under the box, and you pull the string and the stick you know, drops and the box comes out and you caught your birds. I was never patient enough to catch the birds. <laughs> I, had, I had made traps several times. I never did catch a bird with one. I just didn't have the patience for that. But the promise is that if I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, surely he will deliver me from the snare or the trap of the fowler. Now we recognize, of course, that he is speaking in an allegorical sense. And that it is the enemy, Satan, who is seeking to trap me, who has set the snares for my life. And the Lord has promised to deliver me from those snares that Satan has set for me. And his deliverance comes by warning us in advance. Be careful. That is a trap of the enemy. Be careful. Satan is trying to ensnare you. And the Lord is always faithful in warning us of those snares that the enemy has set for us. But we are not always wise in heeding the warning. And many times when we are warned of the Lord, that's a trap of the enemy. He said, well, thank you, Lord, but I know that and I can handle this and I'm able to take care of myself and, and I'm all right, you know. And then we find ourselves snared. I mean, he's got us. And we cry unto the Lord. And thank God he sets us free. He comes and opens the traps and sets us free. He said, I told you. Why don't you listen? I said, I don't know. I wish I did, but 
and, and I'm nursing the wounds from the snare for a while, you know. I, I, I'm licking the wounds, and, and, and I have to go through the healing process because I didn't listen. But, oh, the patience of God and the long-suffering of God as he delivers us from the snare of the fowler and also from the noisome pestilence. The word noisome in its root is evil. Pestilence is plague. The evil plague. Now as I look at this world, I realize that there is an evil plague. And it is sin. And it seems to affect all men. And it is destructive. The very nature of sin is, is destructive. It destroys everything that it touches. And I am really surprised that so many people become involved in things that can only destroy. But he has promised that he would deliver us from this evil plague. And yet, if you're not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, then this deadly plague of sin has a hold upon your life. And some of you today find yourself trapped by some habit or a relationship that you know is destroying you. You can see it destroying you and destroying those you love. And yet you don't seem to be able to extricate yourself from that relationship. You've tried your best to get free but to no avail. And you're living in sort of a hell because you're living in torment. You can see what is happening, but there is nothing that you are able to do to change it. Oh, you need to move today. You need to move into the secret place of the Most High. You need to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. For there, surely, he will deliver you from the noisome pestilence. He will set you free. Again, speaking in an allegorical sense, he said, And he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. Jesus uses the same kind of figure of speech, the allegory in the New Testament. He is looking at Jerusalem and he is weeping. And he declares, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who stonest the prophets and all that God has sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee together as a hen doth gather her chicks under its wings, but you would not. I wonder if Jesus isn't weeping today over many of you, as he desires to be to you a refuge, a fortress, he desires to set you free from that destructive power of sin that has its hold upon your life, and yet you won't come. How often would I have gathered you together? I sometimes think that I was very fortunate to be born when I was born. I, in a way, feel sorry for those that are being born today. I mean, it seems like life and the world is getting more complex all the time. More and more laws to restrict our freedoms, to govern our lives. When I was going to high school in Santa Ana, we had a chicken coop out there in the yard. Growing up in Ventura, we had chickens. 
My mother always had chickens. She liked fresh eggs and, and fresh fryers, and so we always had chickens. And, and from the time I was a little kid, I can always remember the chicken coop. In fact, we'd go out and take the wheat out of the chicken feed and chew it until it became gum. And uh, we, you know, I can re remember watching the old mother hens as they would hatch their new little brood. And these little chicks, uh, they were always so cute. And, and whenever there was any threatened danger that would come into the chicken pen, usually it was me, <laughs> the little chicks would go running to the mother hen, and she'd just sort of ruffle up her feathers. I mean, just she'd have a way of just sort of ruffling them out, and all the little chicks would go underneath and just hide underneath the mother hen until I went out of the pen, and then they'd all come out again. And, and that's the picture here. They, they, were, they were close to nature, and, they, and they, they knew these things. He will cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. The Lord will just sort of, you know, you flee to him. The, the Bible says, the name of Jehovah is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. Oh, that refuge where we so many times flee in the time of danger. And the Lord just says, Hey, how often I would have gathered you under my wings, even as a hen doth gather her chicks. But you would not. Why won't a person seek that place of safety and help and refuge? The only reason why is that they love the darkness where they are living. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And he who believes in me is not condemned. But he who doesn't believe in me is condemned already. And this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, but they will not come to the light, lest their evil deeds be exposed. For men love darkness rather than light. And the only reason why a person won't dwell in the secret place of the Most High, where they might abide there under the shadow of the Almighty, where they might be protected and sheltered by these feathers and wings with which the Lord covers us is that they love darkness. They love living in darkness. Now, the flesh is very attractive and very appealing. Living after the flesh is a very strong pull. It's foolish to try to deny the allurement of the lust of our flesh. But living after the flesh is living in the power of darkness. It is doing those things so often that God has forbidden. And people love to do them. Even though they often know the consequences of doing those things. And this is something I have great difficulty with. When a person knows that this is destructive, this is dangerous, this could destroy you, that they go ahead and do it anyhow. I think of cigarettes. On every package, the Surgeon General has warned you that these have been proven to be injurious to your health. And yet people smoke. They pop the cigarette right on the little Surgeon General's <laughs> warning, you know. And they know that it is proven to cause lung cancer. And that's a horrible way to die. They know that it's proven to cause emphysema, and that's a horrible way to live. 
And yet knowing this, they still smoke. Now I have a hard time understanding that kind of a rationale. We know that sexual promiscuity is destructive, both emotionally physically. We know today that a person who is sexually promiscuous has a very great chance of picking up some sexually transmitted, uh, transmitted virus or bacteria. And we know today that the virus called AIDS, an acronym of AIDS, or the HPV, are very prevalent and are being transmitted today in that community that is sexually promiscuous. Knowing that by entering into this promiscuous affair, I have a good chance of contracting AIDS, HPV, herpes, or any of the other viruses. Yet people, knowing that, remain sexually promiscuous. I don't understand that. I don't understand a man picking up a prostitute on Harbor Boulevard realizing that there's a 50-50 chance that she has AIDS. I can't understand that. A guy engaging in some homosexual practice knowing that you know, there's, a, there's a good chance that you're going to get AIDS. But men love darkness rather than light. So Jesus said, because of their love for darkness, they will not come to the light lest their evil deeds be exposed. They don't want the exposure of the evil, and thus they stay in darkness and they don't come to the light. That I have difficulty in understanding the mentality that would cause a person to remain in darkness when he could come and he could live in the secret place of the Most High and come into this intimate relationship with God and know the blessings and the benefits of walking in fellowship with God. But he would choose rather to live in darkness, the darkness of the flesh, living after the lust of his flesh, being destroyed by these lusts. Living in the secret place of the Most High, we are told that we don't need to fear. We don't need to be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. In other words, God is watching over you 24 hours a day. God is watching over you to protect you from whatever dangers might exist during the day, whatever dangers might exist during the night. The Bible says, He that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. The Lord is thy keeper. And how glorious it is to be able to live a life without fear, without anxiety, living in the secret place of the Most High, knowing that God is watching over me, keeping me, overshadowing me. I really can't understand why anybody would not want to live there. I'm so thankful where I live today. I'm so thankful that I can live in this relationship with God dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, where all of these benefits are accrued to me. The question, I guess, today is just where are you living? Are you living in the secret place of the Most High or are you living in the flesh, in darkness? following the things and the deeds of the flesh. 
the one is being protected and blessed over and over. The other is being destroyed. You know where you're living. God knows where you're living. And I wonder, is Jesus weeping? As he sees you destroying yourself, as he saw Jerusalem destroying itself, as he saw the destruction that was coming, you follow this path, you're going to be destroyed. Your children are going to be dashed in the streets, he said. They're going to encircle you. They're going to wipe you out. And he wept. I wanted to gather you together. I wanted to be your protection. I would have shielded you. You didn't have to fall to the Roman legions. You didn't have to be massacred. You didn't have to experience a holocaust. I would have protected and sheltered you from this. And as he looks at you destroying yourself, I wonder if he doesn't weep and say, you don't have to go that path. You don't have to be destroyed. Come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I'll watch over you. I will be your protector. I will be your shield. I will be your refuge. I will be your fortress. I will be your God. Live in me. Abide in me. May we hear his call. May we answer his call. In Jesus' name. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for that secret place of the Most High where we can live today, where we can abide. There under the shadow of the Almighty. There in that place of refuge, in that fortress, protected, shielded, comforted, loved as you, Lord, just overshadow us. Lord, I pray for those who have been living in darkness, following the things of the flesh, whose lives are gradually being destroyed. Help them, Lord, to move from that place of darkness into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. That we might live in the light as he is in the light, thus having fellowship with each other as he cleanses us with his blood from all of our sin. Lord, speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand? Perhaps some of you today would say, Chuck, I'm tired, I'm weary of living in the darkness. I can see what it's doing to me. I can see how I've been trapped by the fowler by the enemy, and I'm being destroyed. But I want to move. I want to move into the secret place of the Most High. I want to move into that place of refuge in Christ Jesus. I would encourage you to just make your way directly to the prayer room at the close of this service. And there move into the secret place of the Most High. Turn your life over to God. Let Christ begin to dwell in your hearts as you dwell in Him. That you might know the joy, the peace, the confidence of having God as your defense and your strength. May the Lord be with you and watch over you this week and may truly you know and come to experience what it is to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. 
abiding there under the shadow of the Almighty. May God just really minister to you this week in a very special way as you experience his love just overwhelming and overflowing your life. Living in that love, walking in that love, abiding in him as he abides in you. May it be a rich, beautiful week for Jesus' sake. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and, keep thee. and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. The Lord lift up. His Now, on behalf of The Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact The Word for Today at The Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.